Wow. Oh, what a day, huh? I mean, the issue that we really have to think about when we hear all of these inspiring lectures is how do we feel when we pull up to that pump and fill our cars? I mean, are we inspired that these oil companies that are pulling fossil fuel out of the ground from somewhere in the world are providing us that incredible resource and we're happily putting our credit cards in? You know, there's a real need for us to move on. And I want to tell you about a, about a perspective that I've learned working for NASA. So NASA brings us the perspective of the universe and the ability to see at this resolution the Crab Nebula, the supernova. It allows us to see some other planets in the solar system from the Cassini mission that's going on right now, and we can see Saturn as we've never seen it before. We see the Earth from a perspective that lets us look at the weather. And when we think about going to other planets like Mars, and we think about setting up a colony, and this is all sort of conjecture and hypothetical, but if we were to really try to go to Mars, what we would need to do is carry our atmosphere around under our clothes and find every single resource. In fact, going to Mars, we would have to bring plants like microalgae, as you see in this picture, Mars off in the distance. That's a three-year round trip to go to Mars and back. And in fact, when we get to Mars, we have to find everything. We have to find water, we have to find air to breathe, we have to find food, and we have to make everything work. In fact, what NASA teaches us at this level is the notion that we have to be incredibly parsimonious with everything we do. That is to say, waste has to be transformed into food, water, and energy again. We have to do this with the most efficient way possible in order for us to make our way beyond the Earth. Think about it. It's called closed life support systems. And yet, we have a life support system here on Spaceship Earth. And let's talk about how we might take this amazing technology that NASA's been developing, and most importantly, that concept of a life support system, and apply it to something like biofuels. We've heard about biofuels as being potentially a sustainable solution to our fossil fuel problems, but if we're going to be feasible, affordable, most importantly, scalable and sustainable, they can't compete with agriculture. And they can't compete with agriculture because the population of the world is still on an incredible sharp rise. We're supposed to get to 9 billion people in the world by the year 2050, and we're at almost 7 billion right now. So they have to be done without competing with agriculture for water, for fertilizer, and for land. And we have to do it with technology that's available now. It can't be super long-range future technology. So what do we have at our disposal right now? If we look at this graph in which we're looking at gallons per acre per year for biodiesel resources like soy, it's about 50 gallons per acre per year. If we look at sunflower, it's 100 gallons per acre per year. Canola is 160 gallons per acre per year, like, like rapeseed in, in Europe. If we look at Jotropha, it's 200 gallons per acre per year. And palm oil is 600, even better than 600 gallons per acre per year. But look at this. This is microalgae. Microalgae are between 2,000 and 5,000 gallons per acre per year, extrapolated from what we can observe in the laboratory. So what are microalgae? Microalgae are tiny, single-celled organisms that have been around for millions and millions of years. And, in fact, some species of microalgae are responsible for the oil that we're currently recovering from the deep earth. So it's really microalgae that are responsible for the fossil oil, and there are still microalgae on the planet that can provide what we need now, how small are microalgae? This is an image of microalgae with a human hair put in for scale. So we have to ask ourselves the question, can algae then produce the biofuels that we need that will be feasible, affordable, scalable, sustainable, and not compete with agriculture for water, fertilizer, land? And can we develop the microalgae source of biofuels now? So let's do a little thought experiment. I'm going to show you a, a little graphic that we've made in which we describe a system that we're developing at NASA. It's called OMEGA. It stands for Offshore Membrane Enclosures for Growing Algae. So let's imagine that NASA is going to do a new mission, and this mission will be for Spaceship Earth. And the purpose of the mission will be to find a replacement for fossil fuels in less than 10 years, 
And the reason we're going to do this mission is to find and address a solution about climate change and ocean acidification and dead zones. And if we really could successfully do it, it would also address problems of national security. So where can we start this? Let's pretend that we're going to start it in the San Francisco Bay Area, a protected, a protected bay that has a lot of the right features. It has, as we've been hearing today, innovative people. It has a reputation for its innovation, and that's good. It has a number of interesting protected sites. In fact, it has an island, a man-made island called Treasure Island, which has an unexpected treasure. It has a wastewater treatment plant. So let's imagine that we're going to build our Omega system offshore. The wastewater treatment plant dumps its water into the San Francisco Bay. And we're going to use that wastewater now as the basis for growing algae. We're going to redirect the wastewater into these floating photobioreactors. It'll be offshore, so it won't compete for land. It'll use wastewater, so it won't require water and it won't require fertilizer. So what is the system going to look like? Here's the concept. So imagine that we have some kind of enclosure that we're going to float just below the surface, and we're going to put microalgae of our choice into the system and fill it with treated wastewater. This treated wastewater has plenty of nutrients to grow algae, and we're going to let, make it flexible, and, and it's going to be moved by waves. It's going to be, of course, absorbing sun, and the microalgae are going to grow using sunlight, and they're going to use CO2, and, that would otherwise end up in the atmosphere and accumulate, and they're going to produce oxygen. The heat from the sun will be dissipated into the surrounding water, and of course we can use the salinity gradient for something I'll tell you about called forward osmosis. The algae that we'll harvest will be made into fuels, but also cosmetics and fertilizer and even animal food. And the one thing we do have to worry about is the scale, because it would have to be on an enormous scale, and so we'd have to worry about other stakeholders that use these bays that we'd be in, like ships and fishermen, and maybe even surfers, but so we'd have to accommodate all the people. So let's imagine that the system, and I'm going to show you what it looks like, will take treated wastewater, and that treated wastewater will provide nutrients, and will have some source of CO2. The solar energy will be what the algae will grow on, and the temperature of the system will be controlled by the temperature of the surrounding water. Wave energy will allow this thing to mix, and the algae will grow and produce oxygen, and they'll take up CO2. The salinity gradient from inside to outside will allow us to do forward osmosis, which is, a, which is an energetically very favorable thing to do to remove some of the water. If the algae escape, they will die in salt water because they are freshwater algae living in the wastewater. So let's consider the scenario in which the system might fail. So let's say something odd happens, like the thing gets struck by lightning, and the wastewater that leaks out is the wastewater we currently release into our bays and coastal areas, and the algae that leak out are biodegradable. That is to say, the proteins and nucleic acid and the things that they're made of, even the oil that they're made of, will be eaten by the local marine species. And what's not eaten will be freshwater algae, because wastewater is freshwater, so they'll die. The plastic that this system is made out of is a well-known plastic. We're using polyethylene, and we know how to fix this. We know how to repair it and reuse it. So this system should be very good for creating something that we can amortize. The benefits of the system is that we're going to be able to prevent pollution, we're going to be able to clean wastewater, we're going to fix CO2, and we're going to produce these products like biofuels and fertilizer and food. And the system's going to create this incredible marine habitat. That is to say, the floating system itself will create on its underside a kind of opportunity for aquaculture or even for natural species to form like a floating reef. So let me just quickly tell you what we're doing, because I want to convince you how important this is. So we've set up two sites right now, one a research site here in Santa Cruz, we call our Skunk Works, and one at a wastewater treatment plant up in San Francisco. The Skunk Works involves a laboratory filled with people that are interested in trying to solve the problem of making this thing real. We're growing microalgae on wastewater, and we've set up a system for controlling and understanding what's going on. We've set up the hydraulics in our fluid mechanics lab at, at NASA, and we're understanding how to build examples or prototypes of these bioreactors. In San Francisco, we've set up a site at a wastewater treatment plant where we have tanks filled with seawater, we have wastewater to feed the algae, and we have flue gas, which is the source of our CO2. We've built larger bioreactors, and we've 
launched them into these tanks filled with seawater, and we've grown algae in greenhouses that allow us to study how the system would work to process the wastewater at the same time we're growing these microalgae. So this is where we are right now in a project that's supported by the California Energy Commission and by NASA. We're building a system and testing all the features of it. Where will we go next? The next step is to move out into some protected marine environment, a bay like San Francisco Bay or San Diego Bay, or that's a, a picture uh, from the Gulf of Mexico, um, Mobile Bay or the Chesapeake Bay. Here's an artist's conception of what the next stage could look like, a system in which we're looking at a floating series of bioreactors, but it's more than just a floating system of bioreactors. It's an integrated system where we use wind energy and wave energy and biomass energy, which is capturing that solar energy. The system is an example of a kind of ecology of technology. The real key to what we're talking about is how to start folding our technologies so that the concept of waste goes away. So the concept of waste is just that we didn't realize how to use the resource yet. I want to remind you that what we're really basing this on is a closed life support system. A closed life support system shown in this image where the life support system is obviously really difficult. But you know, as people increase in, in the world, that life support system on spaceship Earth is also getting taxed. And we have to remember when we first took this image over 40 years ago and we started thinking of the Earth as our spaceship. And Buckminster Fuller said to us, you know, we don't have, we don't have a owner's manual for spaceship Earth. But I want to remember and remind you of the other statement, which says that we're not passengers on spaceship Earth, we're the crew. Thank you. <laughs>